We're all here. Noel's here. Perry. Perry. I saw Perry. Peter's here. Je yep, I think we're all here. Perfect. So I'll just welcome people to our first budget workshop. It's the extended workshop where we hear the original request proposals from the different administrators. It's going to be a long haul and marathon tonight. So um, thanks all for being here. It is January 26th, 2021. So that being said, um, welcome. I'm going to hand it over to Phil Saucier, our finance chair. Thank you so much, Phil. Thanks, Heather. And um, hi, hi to everyone. Uh, this is my first year doing this. So uh, apologies in advance if it goes off the rails, but I don't think it will. We've um, had some good people here pull this together. And I just want to thank Elizabeth, who's chaired this committee for many years and who um, I'm, I'm going to basically try to follow the process she did um, that I got to witness last year because I thought it went very well. Um, and so just a very brief word about process tonight. We're going to um, hear, as, as Heather said, the presentations from each of the administrators. Um, it's not intended tonight to be a back and forth. So we're going to we're going to listening. It's a sort of listening tour tonight. Um, but you should be thinking about your questions because what we'll do afterwards is I'll come, I'll have you send questions to me that you have on the specific line items or the, or the requests and I'll compile them and that will be more efficient for the next meeting. Um, the next meeting, and if everyone's received this, it's been updated a couple of times, but we do have a budget review schedule. The next meeting will be um, if we don't meet tomorrow night and I'll be cautiously optimistic we won't need it, but we might need it tomorrow night if we don't get through everything. The next meeting for a Q&A will be on February 23rd. And so to give the administrators enough time, I was thinking that it'd be great if, if the board members could send their questions to me by February 12th. And then I will get it to the um, to Donna to be circulated on by February 17th, giving people at least five business days um, to, to review it, if that's okay. If that seems to work for everybody, okay. So, so again, board members, if you could, as you're thinking about, if you're hearing uh, the presentations, I think about your questions, jot them down, get them to me by the 12th, and then I'll get them to the administrators by a reasonable amount of time before the next meeting, um, which is on the 23rd. Um, so we're not going to have public comment tonight as well. I just want to mention that to the members of the public, there will be opportunities at our meetings going forward. We typically have public comment at the beginning and end of our meetings. Tonight, again, is, is a listening session, including for board members. So um, people are always uh, welcome to, to join in and listen, but we're not gonna take public comment at this workshop tonight. Um, I think that's all I wanted to really talk about in terms of process. Um, the last thing I'll do before I turn it over to Donna is just remind people, and I liked how Elizabeth did this last year, just remind people of our budget goals that we adopted at our last business meeting. Um, so the school board's FY22 budget goals are First, to move the Cable of the School District forward with our strategic plan goals. Two, to empower students with the academic, personal, and social knowledge and skills to build balanced and purposeful lives. Three, to ensure equity and access to opportunities for all CAPE students. And four, we'll reflect a, we'll reflect a careful examination of line items in consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Those are our guiding principles as we embark on this journey. So here we go. I'm gonna turn it over to Donna and we'll start working our way through each of these presentations. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna do a short update. Um, we do have some news today. We did receive our preliminary ED 279s today, um, early this morning. So it's great to have them um, so early. Um, and we looks like we're receiving $6,000 more in state subsidy uh, for FY22, which is a real surprise because we were thinking that um, we would be down up to 10%. So, um, so hearing that we're, we're going to get more money than last year is, is uh, just a real celebration. Uh, so as we start looking at the original request budget, um, it's important to know that um, we, we did um, increase salaries. We, uh, there are increased salaries in this budget based on the negotiations that uh, the administrator and teacher negotiations that took place last year. Um, if we had not made any changes to the budget except for 
that increase of sal those increases of salaries and benefits, the increase to the budget would be uh, 4.36%. So that would be exactly the same as last year, but um, noting the increase in uh, salary and benefits. So Heather was asking, we were talking earlier um, this, this morning about what would it have been last year? And last year it would, would have been 4.2%. Uh, um, and the year before it would be 4.3%. So we're really, um, we're really in the ballpark with what's been happening at least the last um, three years. The, the original request budget does include the $300,000 for the design concept. Um, and right now it represents including that um, increase and the new, um, uh, what you're going to hear the request for tonight. There's an increase of 7.4% over last year's FY21 budget. So last year, our original request budget started at 8.3%. Um, so we're at 7.4 this year, so um, so that's good. And the year before, the original request budget was 7.8% over the FY19 budget. So it went 7.8, 8.3, and we're at 7.4% uh, increase over last year's budget right now. But we, we all have to remember, and if anybody's tuning in at home, that this is the original request budget. Um, it does include a 10% uh, increase in health insurance, and that's a holding place because we don't really know what our increase will be, and we won't know for sure um, until we'll be, we can get a little closer in March, and then we will get our um, final numbers, hopefully uh, the beginning of April. But right now, as we as we always do, we put in a 10% uh, increase for uh, to to hold that. Um, that position. So um, we will continue to work to provide the citizens of Cape Elizabeth with a fiscally responsible budget, while at the same time working towards the goals of the strategic plan and within the school board budget goals. So just to remind everybody, um, what you hear tonight is not by any means a final budget. We have we go through lots of work on this budget, lots of lots of meetings and talks and analyzing and but right now we um, were bringing it in at a 7.4 and I'm sure it won't be that um, in the end so no panicking. So those are my updates right now. Um, I was going to say any questions but we're not doing questions. So I think we'll move to Jason and um, you should have gotten the board members should have gotten a packet. Um, that has all of the information um, from the, the um, proposals tonight. Uh, so if you can, hopefully you have those packets and you can follow along. Um, so Jason. Sure, thank you, Donna. I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to, to share uh, my initial proposed budget tonight. So what I had planned to do is go right through that packet and I don't know if it would be easier if I just share the screen with that packet or if everybody, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Heather, should I just kind of go through and. I mean, I'm happy to have uh, Phil weigh in, but we don't usually have yep. a screen up front before. And if everybody's got their packets, I'd rather see people's faces myself, but. Yeah, that sounds Phil, good what to are your too. thoughts as a That sounds okay. good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. And I apologize, Phil, I know that you're you're facilitating as well, I apologize. So I'm gonna go through that packet and if anybody has a question just as to where I am, just stop me. Um, okay, great. <clears throat> so um, first I'm, I'm looking at Pond Cove staffing proposal 2122 mm -hmm. and I'll talk a little bit about enrollment and then um, proposed staffing. So if, if you look right at the top at enrollment, you can see I have, um, actually two projections. Um, you see it says grade K 100. I, all, I typically always um, start this time of year with the budget with grade K at 100. Of course, we don't 
um, know what that will be because we have not started registration yet, but typ typically we hover around 100, sometimes going slightly over, sometimes going slightly under. Um, and uh, so this year, at this time, we have 95K kids. So the projection would be 95 first graders for next year and so forth, grade two, grade three, grade four. The caveat this year is, um, and again, these are not hard numbers. These are projections. You notice it says grade one, 95 students plus 13 who could return. Um, this is based on um, many emails and phone conversations and meetings with parents who either um, decided to um, choose homeschooling or decided to choose a private school and, and a very high percentage said that it was because of COVID and that they were excited to return to Pond Cove once COVID was over or, or things were back to normal a little bit more. So I feel strongly that these numbers are accurate, that actually we're preparing for 108 first graders, 99 uh, second graders, 114 third graders, and 90 fourth graders. Uh, so again, not guaranteeing they all will come back, but it was almost exclusively people went out of their way to mention the fact that they want to come back. So we're really talking about those higher numbers as this budget is uh, represents supporting those students. And to go through, I will go through the proposed staffing quickly and stopping at changes or proposed changes. Um, you can see uh, administrators and administrative assistants stay the same. Uh, and again, I'll highlight proposed changes. Um, we have two school counselors currently this year that would stay the same. Classroom teachers staying at 29 um, this year we have five grade three teachers um, and we're only based on our numbers um, projecting that we would need five grade four teachers next year, but six in all of the other um, grades to maintain appropriate class sizes. Uh, so um, allied arts, world language, everything stays the same. Under academic supports, I have, um, in my initial proposal, I have a change here. So we currently have three literacy interventionists. Those are um, highly trained uh, teachers. They work under a teacher contract uh, and they provide intense one-on-one -on -one or small group literacy support for struggling learners. And uh, that is, um, we found this to be very effective in um, closing the gap and uh, preventing, uh, you know, reducing the amount of uh, special education referrals. We strongly believe that. If you go down to the next line, it says two math interventionists. This would include the proposal of an additional math interventionist. So right now we have one math interventionist. Uh, in that we also do have our RTI ed techs, but I'm talking now about teachers. Uh, so you could see the discrepancy there. We have um, adequate literacy intervention support, but currently have one math interventionist for the entire um, population. So we're serving um, five to 7% of our population typically um, require math support. And we often, our one math interventionist often cannot get to all those kids and cannot service them adequately. So I am proposing a second math interventionist. And this is really kind of two pronged. One, this has been discussed at Pond Cove for several years as a need. Um, and we are really anticipating because of COVID, a great need um, based on what we're seeing now with our, our students in math, a great need moving forward into next year. So um, it's timely because of COVID, but it's also a long-term need. Um, and I'll continue. So tech integrator staying the same. And then I'm down to other professional positions, nurse, no changes here. Um, under regular education support staff, the, R the ed RTI ed techs and the library aid, all of these things stay the same, except at the bottom of that um, category, it says one permanent substitute. So, and let me explain that. So um, the reason I propose this is this year we have a permanent substitute. 
that um, we are very fortunate to have. I mean, it's in place because of um, our anticipated high needs for subs due to COVID. And we are just seeing the benefits of having that person on staff. And I can go over that. Um, I'll go down to my new um, staff proposal in a minute and I can explain more about it. But um, in general, my hope is that we could continue to have a sub on staff. And this year I just had Barb run a report and we have, we have a, a permanent sub and we've used that sub to cover for staff every single day this year. So um, it's definitely needed. And that person is there, they know the building, the routines, the students, and it's just been really a dream. So that's a new proposal. Um, Everything else stays the same. I wanna highlight, I do typically include special education staffing on my, uh, on my proposal, but this is something that Dell and I work very carefully on. So, um, you know, I would want him to comment when it's his, when his, his time to present um, to ensure that this is, we'll be working together to ensure that this is the, continues to be the proposal. So total staff 75.5. And um, I think this really addresses um, our needs at Pond Cove for next year. Um, and I will highlight for the past three years, I think I've mentioned the learning strategist, which is a position that I, um, I believe is a very important and beneficial position. But once again, this year, it does not um, fall high enough on the priority list to uh, even propose it. The, the math interventionist and the long-term sub definitely um, are higher priorities than that. But I just always want to mention kind of what's on the back of my mind, what I'm thinking of that um, would benefit our school. And so the program proposal, this is the permanent sub. I pretty much explained these uh, already, but, and I, you can go over this, but as I explained, you know, teachers often, it's, it's, not, it's common that teachers call out at the last minute. It's not their fault at all because um, they're suddenly feeling sick. They have a young child who suddenly is sick. And, um, and again, it's completely no one's fault, but it's just the reality. And so then we're scrambling and having that permanent sub in the building, um, we've been able to just assign that sub very quickly um, and have coverage in that classroom right away. So it's just been great. So, um, and then the math interventionist, new position proposal, I pretty much explained that. Um, I already explained everything in the form. Um, you know, I, math continues to come up as, a, as a, an area where for our, our most struggling learners, there's, there's typically a group that we're having difficulty servicing and giving them that one-on-one -on -one or very small group intense intervention. And I noticed this year we have the, um, the cost center reports and my budget at Pond Cove budget relatively flat. There are, but, but there are a few um, other than stipends and, and salaries, I'm talking about the, the centers that I budget for. There are a few increases here that are relatively small, but I just did want to mention them. So under um, uh, books and periodicals, there is a $3,000 increase, and that is for um, the budget was really flat, but our fourth grade team is going to begin using a consistent uh, spelling program um, with our third grade team. And that $3,000 is for um, materials for that program. And tech supplies and software, there's a $3,000 increase. That is for um, a, a software called Pick My Kid, and it will help us um, for our dismissal process. It's an app for parents and a software system for us so we can accurately track um, when parents show up, which students they need. We have, it'll, it'll, we can be much more accountable and, and archive data knowing exactly on what dates, where each student went. Um, so we I feel very strongly about that. 
Um, so I just wanted to kind of point out those two. They're, they're relatively small, but they're important things that I've added to my supplies and my um, tech supplies and software. So for me, I mean, that kind of sums it up. I've got relatively flat uh, budget for supplies and materials and books with a few small increases, and I am proposing those two positions. So I know I said a lot, and I hope that you were able to write down some questions and I'm happy to answer them when I, after I receive them. Thank you, Jason. Um, we're gonna move on to Troy, Troy Eastman, middle school. Hi, hi everybody. Um, so I'm gonna kind of follow right along with what Jason kind of, how he just went through his. Now I'm gonna start with the one that says Cape Elizabeth Middle School 21, 22 cost center review. <clears throat> and that really just is a quick snapshot into every, every position in our building, much like what Jason just went through. Um, and, the, and on the top of it is um, our anticipated student populations. So much as you can see, like Jason, um, the grand total in bold of 454 students is would, and that's if, if no students return that are currently out. So um, in that case, we would be about 13 students less than we are now. However, much like Jason, the students that are out are either homeschooled or attending private school. Um, and we have every expectation and hope that they return. Um, and that's been what we've been hearing from the parents as we've kind of reached out just to, to touch base. So um, in the event that all of those students returned, we would actually have about eight more students in the middle school next year than what we currently have this year. So um, I think that is a pretty clear, pretty clear um, way of, of sharing that. Then going down through the staff, um, there are really no changes. Everything's remaining the same. Um, administrators, counseling, social work. The one in bold is the new position proposal that I have put in for a one-year position for an intervention teacher. Um, so that would, that's the one change that you would see. Regular education, classroom teachers, all the same at 37.55. Um, other professional support positions, everything's the same, admin assistance, um, special education staffing. So everything would be the same um, with the addition of the one new proposal for a one year position for intervention. Um, in this budget, the needs that, it, that are addressed, much like la, uh, last year, I guess the first one really talks about the addition of the, of the position I've put in, which is staffing to address learning gaps created through the pandemic. Um, but after that, it's really a continuation of experiential learning. This year, we expanded to seventh grade. Um, this, this budget would continue that with seventh and eighth grade. Um, which really is an attempt to try and get to the multiple pathways goal of the, of the district goals um, and start to spread that knowledge and, and belief. Um, this budget would also allow us to update one of our science labs with new tables and one classroom um, with desks. And it doesn't say chairs there, but it's chairs. <laughs> um, the science tables are, are in pretty rough shape. They've been around for quite a while and it's our goal to start kind of cycling through those. It also allows the continuation of, remember, I think two years ago, we started talking about a, um, and working with Caitlin Ramsey, it's gonna be about a five year process to replace some um, band instruments that are pretty high price tag um, instruments. And you should, they're in, unfortunately, nobody can really see them right now, uh, but they, she's excited, kids are excited. It's gonna change their opportunities. Um, it allows us to continue with peer observations for all staff with no additional cost. Um, this budget will allow us to continue with new software that we've discovered during the pandemic. Um, there have been some things that we've learned and discovered that we wanna keep. Um, so that this would allow for that. And much like Jason, Jason's kind of student tracking system, we much like the high school have, have chosen to do it, use Identikid, a visitor kind of software tracking. So kids can sign in, um, sign out, it's just, it's eliminated the long line sitting at the office, um, you know, getting handwritten notes and, it'll, and it goes right to Infinite Campus for the attendance purposes. It's actually worked really well. Um, unaddressed needs are 
I think improve safety concerns. So it's been a concern to that um, Scott Dyer Road is so near the, the playground and balls that could go across the road and, and all of those things, they're always a concern. Um, and then still doesn't really give us, this budget does not give us additional cameras, updated cameras and things like that. But I think we're good with that. And overall, the middle school non-salary budget is exactly flat. There are no increases in this budget from last year. So um, that's, that's where we are with that. And I'm gonna do the new position proposal last. I'm gonna quickly skip to the, the budget report, the one with all the numbers on it. And it may, I just wanna kind of give you the, my best explanation and I may, may need not Marcy's help, but this can be kind of confusing to me and it could look like there are budget increases in the middle school budget because of the negative numbers on the side and some large, what looks like percentage increases. Um, so if you're looking say at the variance column, which is the last column over before percentages, that's where the negatives are. And, and what that really represents is if there was a need to transfer money from one part of the budget to another. Um, so it does not mean that we are adding money or taking money away from our original request budget. It's just um, for tracking purposes, you know, if for example, software this year was probably under budgeted in the, going into the pandemic. So we would take from another area and put, put to that category. So that's really what that represents. It's, it can be confusing to look at, um, but we are exactly flat with the middle school budget um, on our original request. So now I just wanna quickly jump to the new program um, and position proposal. And I'm gonna save you with my, my slides and all my data um, because I think on the ninth, we have a meeting where we're gonna talk about learning and how it's going during the pandemic. So I don't wanna lose all my thunder for that, but we have, uh, it's really clear. I'm just gonna quickly read this. Um, so the description of this, the, the uh, proposal is a one year position. Um, so that's, it's a one year academic interventionist. Currently we have two interventionists um, full-time on staff. Unfortunately this year they've been called to duty and they're teaching regular courses. So even though we have two, they're not actually working as full-time interventionists. Um, the description of the proposal, and I'm, I'm sorry to read this to you, but I think it's the best way to kind of give the quick overview um, is a one year academic interventionist position um, to instruct and support students as they work to fill academic gaps created during the pandemic. And I think we have to be really careful about um, how we word all of this during the pandemic. It's not that learning has stopped. <laughs> it's not that kids are not learning. Um, and in talking with all my teachers, if they've had some really, really nice ways of saying this. Um, and one of, one of my teachers said, hey, if school is a matter of introducing, practicing, guided practice, independent practice, repeat. And this year, we feel like we're introducing almost everything we would introduce in a typical year. However, we are missing the guided practice and the support. Um, and that is where we're going to see some gaps. And really, in my opinion, this, this pandemic's greatest um, problem is I think that it has really increased um, some inequities between some families can hire tutors, some cannot. Some families have two people that are out working and some may, and students are home alone trying to keep up with this work and do their independent practice. It's truly independent practice. Um, so I, I think that that is really what we are feeling is, is kind of the biggest problem we're gonna experience in our plan for, and, and it really seems to be popping up more in math than reading. And it really makes sense because we read in every class, we read in science, we really read in social studies, we read everywhere. Um, but really grade level standards math only really happens in math class. So um, we are anticipating this position would lean heavily towards math. Um, and to that end, we're, I'm gonna kind of steal some of my own thunder, but um, I think recognizing that problem also requires us to do something about it now and not wait till September. Um, so we're starting to develop a plan for second semester to kind of um, intervene with some of this the best we can. But so this position would be just that, a one year position working with targeted kids um, using the limited data we have of NWA's teacher observations. We're gonna start using our Ascend program more because it has some amazing charts um, that when students use it, we can see the standards they're strong in, the standards they need more work in and time spent. So we're gonna start utilizing that program much more. Um, and I just, our current staffing 
is going to, I just don't believe it can meet that need created by a pandemic. Um, so that's where we're at. And then um, the goal is to close the learning gaps that are for these identified students. Um, and the consequences, it's pretty clear that these gaps are not addressed outside of the regular classroom. So not in replacement of their current math class, but in addition to their math class. Um, so I can envision some double block math next year, things like that happening. Um, then we're either going to have students that continue to um, have less growth or fall behind, or we'll have to slow down the learning for the entire class um, to repeat the instructions. So I think that's a pretty easy choice to make. Um, the other part of this is without a position like this, I would expect some increased special education referrals. Um, and those are some pretty potentially expensive that's an expensive intervention. If we can do a really nice job with our intervention prior to that, um, I think we could get some kids caught back up and on track. So lower cost alternatives, I think kids are gonna have a wide range of gaps and it's gonna be really challenging for any one person to do it. So I think it's gonna have to be a pretty highly qualified teacher to, to do that. And um, at this time, the resources required are just like everything, it's money. Um, so that cost, it would be a cost of a full-time uh, position. And we have the space available for this person in this position. And this would be proposed, I'm proposing it's just with new funds. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that's something that we can make happen and support our kids with. So that is all I have for the middle school. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Troy. That was very helpful. Um, and again, as if you if the board members have questions, write them down now. It's a good time as they're going through, and we'll consolidate them later. Um, moving on to uh, Jeff. Jeff Shed from the high school. Hello. Um, so thanks. Add my thanks to uh, the board for all the time you spend on the budget. And I know there will be tons of it this year, as there are every year. Uh, before I jump into hard numbers, I wanted to share a little bit of information that um, I didn't have the last time we met. It, the school board met. Um, um, our, our debate team this past weekend, this past Saturday, uh, was first in its most recent debate meet, which I think is really cool and speaks to the efforts of our extracurricular coaches to, um, to support their students and give them rich extracurricular op opportunities virtually now. Um, I think yesterday I received word that we have six Allstate musicians who've been recognized, which is really cool. Um, we'll probably share those names at the next board meeting, but it was very exciting, especially since uh, this year the students have never met together, actually. Um, but the teachers have nevertheless been working with them and that sort of thing. Um, and a couple of exciting things is Joanne Lee, our, our chorus director, last week um, had an actor and singer from the musical Hamilton come in and speak, well not come in, but come in remotely into her choir classes and speak to her choir classes. Um, and this, either this week or next week, Christine Marshall, our theater director, is having um, an actor and a singer come in and speak to her theater classes. So the opportunities and almost necessity of sort of making classes engaging this year for students has opened up a lot of thinking about how we can continue some of that really cool opportunities for kids of bringing the world into Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, and obviously having kids go out into the world as well is equally Im important as well, but I think it, it's pretty cool. Um, there was another one that I've completely forgotten. It's either in science or social studies. There's a really big name person who came in and talked to our kids, which was an awesome opportunity as well. I also wanna claim 100% credit. Uh, for any of you who have watched the news last week, you've seen a very creative young man um, lowering pizzas from his apartment in Philadelphia. Um, so that, that young man, if you've seen him and he's raised about $35,000 in charity or something like that, is our very own CEHS class of 2011 graduate, Ben Berman. Um, so that was very cool. I think he was on Ellen the other day. Mm -hmm. um, Troy Eastman was probably watching him in his spare time, but, on Ellen was, but, uh, but anyway, uh, it was a very cool thing. I actually looked and I saw that Ben was actually one of our citizenship award winners at graduation. Um, in, the, in 2011, so it's very nice. Nice young man then, and that has not changed, clearly. It's a pretty amazing story. Um, so now let me jump into budget stuff. Um, so last year, our student population, all these numbers are in the 
the, um, the report, cost center report. Um, and if anybody is not quite sure where I, where I am or whatever, I'm not gonna go through every single line by any means, but I'll hit some highlights. Last year, our number was 529. This year, we're at 544. Next year, I'm expecting we're going to be between 527 and 532. Uh, depending on we, what we see of returns of students who, as in the middle school in Pond Cove, we had some students leave to go to private school because some of the private schools were offering essentially five day a week in person instruction and that was not something that we could do. So depending on how that shakes out, uh, we'll be somewhere in that vicinity. Um, and so between last year and this year, we did add three part-time staff positions. Uh, we added a, a four-tenth science position, which is basically a position that teaches two science classes. We added a six-tenths or three-fifths math position. Um, so that's a teacher who teaches three math classes. In fact, those two positions were combined. So it's actually one full-time position, a gentleman who teaches both math and science. Um, and we also offer, we also added uh, with the board support, a part-time 0.4 French teacher position. Um, and the purpose of that position was not so much numbers driven, it was maybe to some extent numbers driven, but it was more that we wanted for the first time in years to be able to offer a French level one introductory class experience at the high school, which we haven't been able to do for quite a few years. Um, so I am proposing to keep those positions. I'm proposing to keep the science and math position for one more year, I think. Um, and then we'll see what plays out. Um, and sort of my reasoning on that is um, currently our science teachers have the highest average class size of any teachers in the high school um, and a 3% decrease in our student population, two to 3%, depending on what happens, um, is going to simply move the science teachers from the highest average class size in the school to the second highest average class size. Um, so, so I, I think it's, it's not a big enough number to me to do away with that position. And I would say also that if that the other issue is in terms of that gentleman's math uh, part of his position, currently we have no teachers in the Achievement Center this year. Um, we had very few if any last year when we had a very similar science teacher position because we had to prioritize staffing our, our our, uh, our classes, um, and we'd love to be able to begin to think about getting some science teacher coverage back in the in the math in the math world. Um, and in terms of the French position, um, we're still going to need or would like to be able to offer students an introductory French experience for those who need or want it. Um, so I would, I would like the opportunity if we can to continue that, and uh, that's what's in the budget anyway. And obviously, we can talk about those things. Um, so next year, there are three proposed additions to the budget um, that total 1.5 total positions. There's also a, a, a partial position for EL, which I think Kathy will be addressing when she gets to her, her proposal. So I'm gonna set that one aside and, and let Kathy address that. But there is a one-year position, uh, which is, has a, a very same purpose as the proposed increases that Troy and Jason have suggested. Um, and, that, and, and that is a one, a one year position, which is I'm proposing not a permanent position, but a one year position for a primarily math support. Ideally, it would be somebody who's able to support somewhat in science as well, but I think primarily in math. Um, Troy and I have had a couple conversations about the data that he just shared in terms of the NWEA scores and feedback from teachers. Um, I do know that at the last school board meeting as well, there were several community questions and concerns raised about particularly math gaps that may be the result of the pandemic educational experience. Um, so I am offering, su suggesting that for one year. Um, I am proposing a one-tenth increase 
in an art position. So that's a 0 0.1 FTE. It would allow us to offer one section of a proposed course. The, the name of it hasn't been exactly settled on yet, but it's, it's about black artistic expression. Um, and in line with, I think, the strategic plan goals of the school board. Um, and I think our music teacher will be coming into that class to begin to do some interdisciplinary work as well, um, looking at linkages to musical expression as well with an idea that the next year we may have one or two additional electives along those lines to suggest to the board. Um, and then the other partial increase in position that I'm proposing is a 0 0.4 FTE computer programming position. Um, our computer programming numbers have been going up the last couple of years, which is great. We would like to nudge them up even further, and I suspect they will quite naturally. Uh, but we are doing two things to try to um, to entice even more students in a, in a program which is already growing. And one of the things that we're doing will make sense to you if you're a high school parent, and it will probably make, not make sense to you if you're not, and I'll be glad to answer questions. But basically, in our regular school schedule, uh, we have a four-day rotation. And science classes have an additional lab period for one of those four days. For students, the other days when those class periods would be meeting, they are in study halls. And so one of the things we're doing is suggesting that we're going to see if we can pilot a two day a week, two day in the rotation um, uh, computer programming class to provide a computer programming experience, but without having students have to tie up an entire additional period in their schedule. Um, so that's one thing we're doing. The other thing that we're doing is we are, uh, acknowledge we are recognizing that computer programming will get math credit for students as well. I don't believe that that change will in any way uh, reduce the number of students who take our more traditional math classes. But I think it will, it does send an important message about the value of computer programming and the fact that it really is a mathematical thinking process that students are going through um, when they take computer programming. So just between the natural growth of students the last couple of years and those couple of additional things that we're doing, I do think we'll have the numbers in place to have an increased expanded computer programming teacher position as well. Um, so those are the only two changes or three change, three part-time changes or one year changes that I'm proposing in staffing for next year. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the metrics about the size of our staff um, that the board is familiar with from past experience because um, getting, getting a precise handle on staffing in the high school is a little more problematic and just understanding the thinking that goes into the number of sections of classes that we teach and that sort of thing. Um, so for board members who are veterans to this process, I apologize, you might hear some things for the third or fourth time, but um, I think it's good to sort of revisit this. So our average class size this year is 16.7, 16.7 students. Um, and I will say that uh, for uh, probably about 13 of the 20 years that I've been the principal at Cape Elizabeth High School, I remember telling, telling parents who ask, our average class size is 16.7 students. We are, not, um, we are not adding things unnecessarily. We are right in line with where historically we have been in terms of average class size. Um, and I will say, and I've said this to the board multiple years as well, that when I give tours to families, when I used to be able to give tours to families, um, I've done a couple of virtual ones this year, but I, when I used to give physical tours to families considering CAPE or some of the other schools that if they're thinking about CAPE, they would typically, families would be typically considering. The one question that every family without fail in 20 years of doing this has asked is, what's your average class size? Um, it's a really important metric for families who are considering where to send their students to school. Um, 
And I have given you, um, I'm not gonna go through the document. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions prompted by any information on the document. I've given you a two page document that shows the, the class size for every class that every one of the high school teachers is teaching this year at this moment. Um, and so you can see what those are. So you, if you wanna know the size of Mr. Jordan's classes, you can look at the size of each one of Mr. Jordan's classes or Ms. Nielsen's classes or Mr. Sh Mr. Phillips's classes or Ms. Medina's classes, they're all there. Um, so I'm certainly happy to have you um, have that information and ask any questions about it at a later time. Um, our student teacher ratio, now this is a different number. Um, it's different from class size. Class size is um, you just total up all the classes, all the students who are taking all the classes in our school, you divide by the number of classes that those teachers teach in total, that's the average class size. Um, student teacher ratio is a different number. It's a metric um, that says, total up all, this, all the students you have in the school and total up, add up all the regular edu education teachers that you have in the school. So all the English teachers, the math teachers, the science teachers, and on and on and on. Um, and then divide the students by the teachers and that's the student teacher ratio. And that number this year is 13.4. I would bet that next year it will go down to about 13.3. Um, and as the board has heard in the past, that number is right in line with where any of our comparison schools have been, at least in the recent past. I haven't looked at those numbers this year. Uh, a couple years ago, some of the board mem members will remember that I, I did an analysis and looked up all the, the best schools in America, according to Newsweek and US News and things, and you could find um, student teacher ratios for that. And we were right in line with most of the schools there, we were, there were a few schools that were above us, but very few. Um, and there were a fair number of schools who had a smaller student teacher ratio than, than we did. Uh, meaning that we had fewer staff for students than, than, than those students did, those uh, excellent schools did. Um, so, and as the board will remember, if you've been through this before under that document that Donna mentioned earlier about the, What's it called, Donna? The e, e, ED 279. ED 279. Uh, the, 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 the student teacher ratio that the ED 279 uh, uh, document assumes or bases its subsidy on, its state subsidy on, is 16 students per regular ed education teacher. Um, and our number is. So our number is obviously lower than 16 students per teacher. But I can tell you that the number of every other small, comprehensive, high-performing um, college preparatory school in Maine is nowhere near 16. You will not find any high-performing schools having student-teacher ratios of 16 to 1. In fact, you will not find many schools at all having student teacher ratios of 16 to 1. Last year, I provided the board a link to a, a study that was done. It was either last year or the year before that summarized the, the student teacher ratios for many schools. Um, and I can send that, I can share that link with the board again if you're interested. But that 16.0 is very much out on a high size outlier. It does not reflect the reality of what, what, uh, what most schools are doing and certainly not most high performing schools are doing. Um, if we went to a 16.0 student teacher ratio, which is what the state bases its ED 279 subsidy forecast on, our average class size would go from about 16.7 to 20. Um, our student load per teacher would go to around 100 uh, which would be well in excess of school board guidelines under your under school board policies. Um, so we are not overstaffed compared to comparison schools. Um, and, and so I wanted, wanted to address that. Uh, all right, so on, that's, that's sort of the staffing side of things. Um, on the non-salary, non-staffing side, um, 
the, the message is that our budget is literally as it is in Conco and, 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 and the middle school, it is flat. Um, I mean, it is, it is flat. In fact, it's a little bit less than it was last year and the year before, um, but not much less. It's basically flat. Um, I asked the department chairs after hearing from the superintendent that we wanted to go in with a very frugal budget this year because we're anticipating the possibility at that time of significant state subsidy cuts, which thankfully haven't, haven't, doesn't look like they're going to be coming. But the department chairs took my request seriously and they came in with flat proposals and in many cases decreases in individual, individual line items. Um, so we are completely flat. I will say the only significant equipment purchase that we're planning this year, which is in any way out of the ordinary, is uh, we are putting in the program of studies this year, subject to the board's approval. I think at the next board meeting, I think you'll be having our, looking at our program of studies. Uh, one of the new courses that we're proposing to offer is a course called Music Technology. Um, it's, I think it'll be a really, cool course uh, that has the potential to draw a very diverse set of students who are not necessarily part of our, our core music program. Um, Mr. Wheeler, who's our instrumental music teacher this year, has a master's in music technology. Uh, he has taught music technology in the past. Uh, in order to make that class possible, we do have to buy, I think it's seven iMac computers and there's some electrical and cabling work that has to be done as well. Um, but notwithstanding that, our non-salary budget is flat. There's no staffing cost associated with the music technology offering at all. We can do that within Mr. Wheeler's current um, class schedule. There's a couple of additional shifts of expenses into the high school budget. Um, this year, one is $3,000 to pay for our students to take what's called the Apple exam. Um, and I don't remember what Apple stands for, but it's AAPL. It's an exam we first started to give last year to our junior and senior, mostly French and Spanish students to give them an opportunity to earn what's called the seal of biliteracy. Um, so the cost of that exam is being shifted appropriately into the high school budget. And we're also shifting some other costs in to, for students to take the PSATs. That's about $5,000, I think, that used to be in a district-wide budget. Um, and we're also, we've also included a couple of thousand dollars uh, to get subscriptions for a couple of uh, new uh, online programs that have been very, proved to be very useful during hybrid and remote education. And we expect will continue to be useful uh, once we go back to regular school. So I think that is, I think that's my budget presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yep. All right, um, moving on to Del Peavy for special services. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen or is the majority of it anyway? Um, so I kind of went at this from a different angle and looking at the students that we serve. And um, I used the October child count numbers going back to 2017. And as you can see, um, we have increased um, I wouldn't say significantly, but we have definitely been trending upward as far as the number of students served in special education. Also down below, I did put the percentage, and this was based on the enrollment at each one of those child counts. And um, that also is trending upward, but also is you know dependent on the number of overall enrollment. Um, and currently, so I did the October 2020 um, both the numbers that we uh, provided to the state and also the percentage of students from the general education, from the entire enrollment, 
but also I did our current. So currently um, we're at 172 students that we're servicing in special ed, and that puts us at 11.5%. I did also put the, uh, I was showing you the state average, which is hovering at 18.54. So overall, uh, Cape Elizabeth is doing um, very well. Um, I, one of the positions that was asked for last year was a additional ed tech three position at Pond Cove. And the reason for that was we had incoming students uh, from CDS who required additional supports. And um, those additional supports would have maxed out. We did not have the resources at the time to provide those uh, resources. Um, but the students um, that were slated to come last fall um, were, uh, CDS has a 676 clause in which they have the option to stay with CDS for an additional year, depending on when their birthday falls. And the students chose to do that. So this position was never filled, um, but I am requesting that the position stay in the budget because those same students will be joining us this fall. That is the plan at this time. The one of the requests I have for the board is um, a 0.5 or half time academic assessment specialist. So as our numbers uh, trend up, our special education teachers, which we have 13 of across the entire district are um, struggling to meet the academic assessment needs of our students. In other words, um, our teachers who are providing the direct instruction have to carve out time to also do the academic testing and write those reports. Um, and as, as uh, the numbers increase, this has become more and more difficult. So this is to alleviate some of that, particularly uh, we have uh, bubbles in different spots with regard to numbers. And so those folks who have high caseloads, we would focus on them in helping to do some of that academic testing that is what this halftime position would do. So that's the reason for that request. Um, the other piece, uh, there is a stipend that's in the budget that you'll see, and it's under the middle school. And this is a clinical coordinator for the Beacon program, which is essentially our day treatment program at the middle school. Uh, this program was created approximately four years ago and um, has been utilized um, very efficiently, but the folks that are running it have had no oversight and su support and supervision other than myself. And uh, most day treatment programs have a clinical coordinator so that they can meet with those staff on a regular basis. So this is actually a stipend position that um, would, would fulfill that role. Um, I'm also requesting that we're shifting three of the ed tech salaries and their benefits from the local entitlement grant into the local budget. The reason for this, and it'll uh, kind of, the visual will be on the next slide, but has to do um, primarily with Maine retirement. And that when we use federal funds for Maine state, uh, federal funds to pay employees, the Maine state retirement uh, percentage is 19, 0.19, I believe, and Marcy can correct me if I'm if I'm off. Um, whereas if we're paying them through the local budget, it's 4.1. So a huge difference in um, a big chunk of local entitlement money being spent on that additional main PERS. Um, but I'll explain that in the next slide. Um, increases in the extended school year budget levels as we anticipate the need for more um, more robust ESY program, given the current hybrid model that we're in. Again, kind of in alignment with what the other folks are mentioning is that um, there's gonna be some skill deficits that may develop for some of our students 
and we'll uh, the extended school year program or ESY is one of the avenues that we have to address those. Um, and I, I spoke to you and I spoke about the last bullet and that was the half time special ed, uh, ed teacher who will be doing the uh, academic assessing. And this, this graphic just kind of breaks down and explains and um, the moving the three positions out from local entitlement. So if, if you don't mind just looking at the bottom of the screen, you can see the difference from the 19.2 for the four to the 4.16 for main PERS, the difference being $14,112 a year for these three individuals. And um, the other piece is there'll be pieces that are moving out of the local budget into the local entitlement. And one would be uh, my admin assistant at central office, salary and benefits uh, would be moved into local entitlement and out of district tuition and services that is currently in the budget would also be moved to um, local entitlement. So that's what this breakdown is, is the 148,340 is total amount for salary and benefits for those three ed techs. And then we'd subtract the 14,000 um, of the additional cost for main PERS and the um, the admin assistant salary and benefits, as well as the 45,000 for out of dis district tuition. So the net impact to the general fund would be the 11,365. And um, with regard to staffing, uh, although I didn't provide this in writing, but certainly can, we currently have 52 staff members and that includes 13 special education teachers, 25 ed tech threes, um, and that's not including the new position, which would be an, another additional ed tech three. We have 3.5 speech pathologists. We have 2.2 full-time OTs. We have a 0.4 physical therapist, um, two full-time psychologists, 3.5 social workers, and a one full-time BCBA behavior analysis analyst. Um, and I believe that is all I have for you folks. Thank you. Thank you, Dell. <clears throat> and now we're back and we'll move on to Noel, her offer technology. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> uh, mine's gonna be kind of short and sweet. Uh, basically, just going over the line items. Um, and so I really only have three line items that was an increase. Uh, first one is, uh, is the maintenance and, and repairs of, of the technology equipment for the, uh, through the department. Um, as you know, we have left all the uh, um, devices, students' devices go home this year, which has been fun for maintaining these devices. Um, and so there has been a significant increase with repair costs and maintaining them. Uh, if that happens in the future, um, we're gonna have to uh, address that issue. So that has been an increase. Um, also, um, one of the things that is driving all this um, in my, my world is uh, the question mark about MLTI, which is, um, Governor King, when he was governor, had um, an initiative to supply all seventh and eighth grade students with laptops and their teachers um, and expanded into networking. Um, it also expanded as it grow, grew, it was al allowed us to buy other um, grade level equipment. And last year was really the time that we were supposed to replace all the fifth and sixth grade and um, middle school staff laptops or um, devices. And unfortunately they called that a bridge year because there was a discussion on how they were gonna morph the program into the 21st century. Um, and as I speak to you right now, there has not been a decision on what they're really going to do with MLTI. Um, every month uh, we, we, I get together with uh, most of the tech directors and tech um, coordinators for the state of Maine. And we, you know, we also talk to the uh, DOE 
up at, uh, I have a couple of representatives from DOE come and talk to us and we're still kind of trying to figure out where we're going to be. Um, I don't think that we're gonna really have a decision until April, probably the end of April. And basically it's based on, you know, the governor and all the legislator looking at the, the proposed bu budgets and what they deem the most important and so on and so forth. So that's what's infecting that one repair and maintenance budget. Um, the other thing that um, is uh, also went up was my software budget. Um, there's a thing called Zoom that uh, has entered into my software budget for $19,000. If that wasn't there, that would have been pretty flat. And then finally, um, down by, um, so the, not finally, but um, the other thing that has increased is I have a $70,000 holding um, budget in uh, the middle school technical um, place. And that's just basically because I really don't know. And, you know, I don't know what devices, you know, is going to be, um, we're going to be able to uh, get from the state or if they're going to just give us a, a number per student. Um, again, it's so up in the air that um, uh, I just thought that it was wise to put that 70K there just to say, hey, look, you know, we got to really pay attention to the fifth and sixth grade levels um, because we really don't know what's happening there. And down at the bottom, um, at the middle, at the high school uh, lease, which is 9073-4430. Um, that was actually a miscommunication between myself and Marcy. And so I take 92% of that blame. Um, and uh, what happened was last year, I entered a lease with Apple and the lease also did um, not only the staff uh, laptops at the Pond Cove, but also the ninth grade iPads are the devices that we get every year in ninth grade to, so that they have a device all the way through their experience at the high school. And so there's $29,000 there that really should, that, that is uh, up in uh, the Pond Cove budget, but it really should come out of that. So if I take the 29 out and I take the 70K out and I take the 19 for Zoom out, um, you will definitely see that my budget has not increased, it actually has decreased. Um, one of the big reasons why it really decreased was because of the, uh, the CARES Act that we had. Um, we were acquired or we, we were got funding, but one of the things, the positive things about that is the money that came in, we were able to do a lot of um, technology um, purchasing to help us with the COVID, um, su such as second monitors, microphones, um, headsets, uh, more um, access points. Um, we also replaced uh, the um, anticip anticipation of what's happening in the Milty. We also replaced all the uh, um, staff laptops at the middle school. And so that we used that money there. We also uh, bought some iPads and they're kind of just in boxes right now. Um, the re reason why they're in boxes is twofold. One, is that we had to spend the money. We were told by the um, 31st of December and the items had to be in the school at that time. It's not something I wanted to do. Um, as you know, at the beginning of school year, we, we release all the, the devices to all the, the, the students of Cape Elizabeth. It is a long process to do. Um, and we try also to use those devices as long as possible. Um, I believe we do get every single penny out of them. Um, but so we do have that, you know, those 250 devices up there. Plus we're gonna have about 130, 138 devices that will be quote retired because the seniors will be graduating. And we always bring those down. And so we do have that little, little bunch of devices. And again, if things get worse or, or, or better or whatever, we have that kind of hold there and say, okay, you know, we're not getting any multi devices. Where, you know, should we give those to the seventh and eighth grades? Or we're getting funding there, then we can bring them down to, to, to Pond Cove. Okay. Um, so those are there. Um, other than that, that's what I have. And I look forward for the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. <clears throat> Moving on to Perry for facilities and transportation. Good evening. Thanks for uh, 
having me here. Um, for the most part, the facilities budget is also remaining the same. We do have some uh, uh, increases in staff salaries and things like that due to the uh, bargaining agreement that we have with them. And um, uh, I do not have any additional staff requests this year. I'm kind of kind of holding the budget because typically I reflect back on the previous year and, and maybe go a couple of years further back than that. But given the year that we're having that we're currently in, it's not a good way for me to reflect on uh, what, a, what a typical year should look like. So in, in that event, I've kept the budget for the most part the same. So I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. Um, in certain areas. And then I'm going to also add on to it. It's not in the agenda, but we'll uh, take a look at the capital improvements budget as well. And that that's where the bulk of that I think the interest will be at this point. So uh, in the 9002 bracket for the K to eight building, um, really the only highlight I have in that area is the 7301 equipment line. Uh, we did a deduction of $4,000 in that line. That line is basically custodial or maintenance related equipment, uh, like a floor scrubber or something like that, that has a high uh, cost to it. So uh, like Noel had said, we got, had some help from the covered relief funds that helped us out this year with that. So I think we can reflect that help and uh, knock it down a little bit for next year. Um, in the 9003 for the uh, high school budget, uh, we are showing a deduction of $2,088 on the water side. That is just basically uh, due to historical, um, just evaluating that line over the, over the years and showing that we could do a cut in that line of $2,088. Uh, let's see. Insurance and bonds, um, those brackets are more of a Marcy's profession, so I'm not going to get into those. Uh, Marcy plugs those numbers in based on the documentation she has in the overall school budget. Okay, flipping up to the next page, uh, item line 6,000 against the Custodial supplies, we're going to knock that down $1,960. And that is also based on the history of that line. Uh, heating fuel is going to slightly go up at the high school due to history of $3,037. And the equipment line for the high school building is also going to get deducted uh, $4,000. The 9005, the overall campus uh, K through 12 facilities management category. Uh, item 3400, professional services. That is uh, in a reflection of what we're setting aside for the K to eight building design process. That is, that is obviously an increase. 4301 for capital improvements. I have that marked up as uh, being up $66,000 this year from last year. And again, we'll get into that as soon as I get through the transportation budget. Uh, cell phones, 5320 is up $2,263. And that is solely due to, we have a lot of staff using their cell phones that are in a, I'll say in a higher level position where we, they need that contact with other staff members within our department uh, that were missed. They were using their cell phone and we're not getting any credit for that. Uh, travel expenses are down $300. And that wraps up K to 12 highlights. Transportation, 9020. Uh, down to the travel line, 5,800. Uh, we knocked off $200 there. And we knocked off, six, oh, I'm sorry, $815 off of the gasoline line, 6260. And then the remainder again is um, kind of my, Marcy's profession. On to capital improvements. Uh, now the capital improvements list it's, it's a little early, 
I, I, I'm going to consider this more of a living document at this point because a lot can happen between now and July 1st. Um, but for the most part, I, I, this will give us a good idea of, of what it's going to look like. And uh, at the Pond Cove, we have painting of the second grade classrooms and all new shades throughout that area. That's the entire wing will get repainted. That was on the schedule for last year and we cut it from last year's budget. Um, due to working with the engineers and architects, we took some money out of that budget and, uh, and what, this is one of the things that got cut. So we're, we're a little behind. Uh, replacement of the stair treads um, at the fourth grade. That's, uh, they're just completely worn out. They're actually cracked and, and somewhat falling apart. So we were looking to get those replaced. Continued exterior door hardware and security upgrades. That amount will do about two doors on the exterior of a building, uh, give or take its location. But uh, that's the replacement of two doors in that building. The whiteboard replacement project, that is something that Jason, myself, and Noel are working together on. And this cost here is for the carpentry involved in removing existing uh, chalkboards or, or old whiteboards, depending on the classroom, and the installation of new boards. Uh, we do own the boards at this time. There, there is 45 new whiteboards bought with COVID money that are currently sitting just outside the fourth grade wing. And uh, so this would be the money to the, install them. Uh, that also includes electric for new projectors that would be getting installed with this project. So each whiteboard, uh, if they don't have a projector in that room would be getting a new projector. Um, and I believe, I believe Noel had mentioned also as far as uh, speakers as well. Uh, painting in the, on the wall that it, that it affects sometimes when we remove the board, there could be painting that is affected or moving of a material around it could expose some old paint. So that also is to budget to paint the wall that the whiteboard is mounted on and the demolition and, and removal of the old boards uh, if they're not worthy of keeping. Uh, annual roof repairs, $3,500. That is basically set by a contractor that we have, that we worked with and they do inspections. And this is part of their uh, evaluation of our roofs and the amount of work that needs to be done to uh, do some patching and items like that. Uh, general exterior building repairs, I've put under each building. And this is kind of, this is kind of where I'm gonna I have it as exterior building repairs. I would like to rephrase that and have it more of a general building repair and remove exterior. And th this could really be something up and coming that we do not see right now, um, given that we have five months until this budget comes ready to, 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 to use. Um, Jason, I saw just at, uh, sent me an email today with a request that he was trying to get in at the last minute. So it's something I could use to uh, tackle, tackle that request. Uh, the middle school, eighth grade classrooms, just similar to Pond Cove, that is a uh, painting of the entire wing and the installation of new shades on the windows. That's $25,000. Continued exterior door and hardware security upgrades, that's 21,000. Again, that's similar to what we're doing over at Pond Cove. You're gonna see that throughout. That's been an ongoing maintenance thing over the past few years. Annual roof report repairs again, uh, 6,200. Commercial kitchen hood with fire suppression, $12,000. We have a kitchen hood, or I'm sorry, an, a stove in the special ed department at the middle school that does not have the appropriate fire suppression for that stovetop. Um, given that it's a commercial building, it need, even though it's not a commercial stove, given that it's a commercial building, it does need to have a uh, stainless steel hood over it and a fire suppression system that can be activated, um, you know, in just a push of a button or with flames. Uh, code required repairs to elevator room. That is something that was called out in the Colby report. 
general exterior building repairs of $15,000. Again, that's just kind of a buffer of things that are coming in. Or if I don't have anything coming in, it's going to go towards painting of the exterior, rotten wood, just, just general uh, things that we need to uh, freshen up. Uh, install installation of a boiler room heating unit, $16,500. When the boiler room was built at the middle school uh, that heats both the middle school and elementary, there was never any heat installed in that boiler room. And given that we have high efficiency boilers, they don't put out any heat <laughs> uh, as far as out, their, out of their jacket. So really what we're doing is when those boilers fire up, a fresh air damper opens up to allow them to burn properly, bringing in outside air. So given whatever temperature it is, we'll say 20 degrees out, that 20 degree air is coming in flooding the boiler room. And it's, it's, it's caused problems with our uh, stacks that we are currently getting replaced. And uh, it's also a threat to the plumbing that's in that space. So this is to pro provide a heater in there to compensate for that fresh air that's coming in. Not uncommon. It was just something that I guess was never installed. At the high school, we have our continued window replacement. And again, that's just something we have ongoing with uh, windows that are failing, whether it be the glass itself or the frame around the window where we have water leaking into the building and uh, actually ruining walls and uh, paint. That is a $32,000 line item. New carpet and vinyl cove base in the main office, $18,000. Uh, that was put in last year and was cut from last year's budget. So I, so I put it in this year. Uh, that carpet is about, I don't know, I'm gonna say seven to 10 years past its lifespan. So it, it, it is long past due. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm just putting it again this year. $21,000 for continued exterior door hardware and security upgrades. That's similar to the other three schools. You're just gonna see that across the board and that's due to the coastal environment uh, and the metal doors and salt and sand and uh, uh, the frames around the doors. They just, they're at the end of their life. So we're just gradually knocking them off one by one and just going by which are in the worst conditions. Uh, interior painting and improvements throughout. Uh, basically, I just leave that open and we call it as we see it in the high school. Um, high school walls don't seem to get as much uh, um, abuse, for lack of a better word, than the uh, middle school and uh, elementary buildings. But um, we, do, we do go in and if a teacher makes a request that their room is showing some age or if we see something uh, a lot of doorways, door frames, uh, they're showing signs of wear and tear. So we'll just, we just use that line item to cover anything uh, that needs to be addressed. New carpet and vinyl cove base in the chorus room, $9,500. That was an item that was cut in this year's budget uh, to, to help us, given that chorus was kind of a, a difficult program to run this year. Um, and they didn't, weren't able to spend much time in their classroom. That it was decided that that money be cut and uh, used in another place. Uh, again, $7,200 of annual roof repairs. And I'm, I increased the high school only because of due to the, uh, where, we're, where we seem to be going with the building project. I wanna put a little bit more money into the high school versus the Pond Cove to, to kind of get a head start on moving forward with the uh, extending the longevity of the school until we can, uh, until we can address the building in a, in a larger scale. Uh, Campus-wide upgrades, again, is uh, ongoing security upgrades with electronic locks and cameras. I would like to remove servers from that line that was installed this year. Uh, safety bollards. $6,000, that is the transformer at the service entrance to the middle school does not have anything around it where a vehicle, a tractor trailer, a garbage truck, all, all the, any vehicle that goes into that area, and there are a lot of them, uh, this year we've got a lot of parents. Uh, there is nothing guarding that transformer that if somebody were to hit it, it would take out the building uh, and, and quite possibly the high school and pool as well. 
Um, so we just want to put some safety bollards around that to, to prevent anybody from backing into it. Interior, uh, installation of exterior LED lighting, $10,000. That focus is going to again be starting at the high school area. And that's just the perimeter of the building. It could be uh, a parking lot street, street light. It could be a light that's mounted on the building. We have a lot of old high pressure sodium. And what we're seeing now is due to the cost of the uh, equipment um, and, the, and the fairly inexpensive LED lights, it's cheaper to buy a brand new LED light than it is to buy the parts for the older high pressure sodium lighting. And, and, and the, the longevity is just by far superior. An LED light, you know, can last you 10 years without ever being replaced where a high pressure sodium light bulb could be a year until somebody has to go up on a lift and, and change the light. And, uh, and we get energy, continued energy savings out of that as well. And the last thing is transportation. Uh, we have $35,000 in there for camera and video upgrades. There was a state mandate that now requires us to have three cameras in all our buses. And uh, that is to compensate for those cameras. And also I believe two of the buses uh, have older recorders that would not be able to handle the newer style camera. So it would also, that price also includes two recorders. Um, and that is it. I hope I didn't go too fast, but you know. <laughs> no, that was great and comprehensive. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, Perry. Uh, moving on to Kathy Stankard for three different categories, improvement of instruction, English learners, and gifted and talented. Correct, and good evening, everyone. So I'll start with the improvement of instruction cost sensor, divided into four, Pond Cove, middle school, high school, and district wide. And we would um, like to continue to secure $15,000 per school for summer curriculum work. Um, last summer, we supported, that money was used to support 40 projects. It was, as you can imagine, very, very helpful to teachers to be able to prepare for this, this year in particular, but it's been used every year um, at, that, at that amount. Um, this cost center also uh, provides for professional development and the travel and support of that professional development. And as we have in the past, we'd like to continue to um, offer staff $250 for individual, what I think of as feed your soul professional development that allows them to grow as educators and to transfer that knowledge and skill to their students. Um, and then we budget $100 for, for the related travel expenses. This cost center also um, contains money for course reimbursement. This is money that's available um, to teachers and to ed techs, um, I should say to any member of the Cape Elizabeth Education Association um, or, or to, the, to the ed techs, um, the specific amount um, that they, the specific benefit depends on the, on the particulars of the bargaining agreement. Um, you will notice that um, the amount requested for Pankova in the high school is approximately $50,000 and for the middle school is approximately $100,000. And that, um, those are based on prior year requests um, and those are placeholders at this point in time. We have asked teachers who are interested in being re reimbursed for coursework um, in the next fiscal year to apply for that benefit by this Friday. Um, after which we'll be able to adjust those numbers, but I would expect that we'll be able to cut that middle school number in half just based on the request that I'm receiving so far. Um, also in this cost center then would be the stipends paid to um, our recertification committee members, our evaluation com committee members, and to our peer mentors. Um, these are uh, Department of Education requirements and um, the stipends are negoti negotiated um, as part of the, um, the collective bargaining agreement with the CEEA. Um, 
Then there is a line for, as was mentioned, um, the external assessment line, which used to include uh, funding for the Apple exam used to support students applying for the Seal of Biliteracy and the PSAT, those have been moved to the high school cost center. And so now this cost center is just for um, the NWEA. Um, if the state, <laughs> I see Donna smiling. If the state adopts the NWE, NWEA as its uh, annual accountability assessment, then this number will also drop because they will be assuming the cost for students in grades uh, three through 12. So we would then just have to pay for um, access for our first and second graders. So there could be some good news there. Um, there is an increase in the district-wide online resources line, um, which pays for IXL and Newzella, and that is because we have uh, Newzella this year, but it's been paid through the um, uh, corona, the CRF funds, the corona, coronavirus relief funds. Um, so we would need to absorb that next year in the local budget. So that's the Improvement of Instruction Cost Center. Um, the English Learner Cost Center is K8912, and this includes funding for currently um, for a uh, 1.5, um, I'm sorry, a 1.0 English Learner Teacher Salary, and then a 0 0.5 EL Ed Tech position. Um, we are proposing to convert that half-time EL Ed Tech position into a half-time EL teacher position so that we would have 1.5 EL teacher position. And if you've had a chance to review the, um, the new position request, um, we anticipate next year um, wanting the, um, that, addition, that, that Ed Tech to push into regular classrooms at Pond Cove in particular. And um, if, to, to push into classes, it, to, to a regular education classroom just requires a, a really unique skill set. Um, you really need to have been trained in language acquisition. You need to know how to scaffold in real time. It's just, it's, it's work that demands the knowledge and skills of, of a trained, certified, um, English learner teachers. So um, we think it would be much better for the students um, to, um, to have, a, 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 again, a trained certified teacher um, supporting, supporting their learning in the, in the regular education classroom. Um, and that the cost to converting that position from an ed tech to a teacher position would be about $17,000. And then the final cost center that I'm going to talk about is our um, gifted and talented. Um, this, um, as with the English learner, it, it, this cost center includes funding for salary and benefits. We have a 1.0 GT teacher, um, retirement professional development, dues and fees, et cetera. Um, we also put in money for the online assessment that we use for screening and identification and for books and supplies specific to the gifted and talented program. And uh, I think that about does it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you do have the um, new position request form in there as well for us. To yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, on to Peter. Esposito, we're moving along at a fairly good clip here. Good, and I'll be even quicker. Um, this year, definitely, and last year has been very challenging for our department as we're a revenue-based um, budget based on the sales of our meals, um, a la carte sales, vending, la, um, catering. So we um, we had a rough year. We were luckily, luckily able to um, either quadruple or um, five times over our um, federal subsidy as we get the um, waiver to supply the meals um, to the students for free, but also um, increase the amount of subsidy we get per meal. So we were able to generate um, revenue based on that. Also, 
um, we had several grants that we did receive to help offset some of the costs. But as um, from last year, we definitely had a deficit as we paid employees for the whole year where we had basically zero revenue coming in from many other sales. Um, as this year goes on, obviously we, we no longer can do vending or sell a la carte, which would be, you know, no bottled water, no drinks um, to limit contact. So um, our revenue stream has been down, but luckily, um, like I said, that our, our subsidy has increased um, um, from, from our waivers that we received. Um, as far as this budget goes, based on, based on the different lines, the increases are only based um, pretty much just salaries that were contracted um, that, we, that we need to um, increase the labor by that. But there's also one other line in there that um, we added this year, which is a $6,000 for technical supplies, which that um, I was trying not to put that in there, but it's for our contactless ordering system and also uh, supplies the licensing for that. Um, so that's one cost center that, that did increase on, on this budget for me, other than the salaries. Um, but also we, um, we kept our equipment line at 5,000, which I would have been asking for more this year, but we had diverted some COVID funds to purchase some equipment that's needed to service our, our bulk feeding students, our remote students and, and all that. So um, we've also had an increase in our, our paper um, supplies um, and also there's been some food cost increase because of obviously shortages in different um, areas. So we, we did use our COVID funds to divert some of that. And we also, like I said, got grants for some of the equipment um, to use, but we're, we're thinking um, unfortunately ahead that maybe next year, even if it's not for the whole year that we'll still have to do the contactless um, um, service for meals. And um, in last year's previous budget, I had decreased my labor. I have 12, 12 employees um, other than my third time self. Um, and we had decreased by one person through attrition. Um, and also that was trying to uh, be a cost savings, but um, with last year's pandemic that didn't happen. So um, that is really all I have. The, the increase is the increase from the contractual and the 6,000 line for um, technical supplies. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Moving on to Jeff Thorak in athletics. I see Jeff, Jeff here. Jeff, you're muted. Yeah, can't hear you. All right. Sorry. Good. There you are. Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, as, as the rest of the group has mentioned uh, this year's budget process has presented some unique challenges um, just given the uh, the atypical school year um, but especially with athletics in regards to cost analysis um, so predicting op operational budget data and, and interpreting that it, it, it's definitely going to look askew this current year uh, with middle school athletics um, at a very running at a very limited capacity and high school um, athletics occurring but on a much smaller scale than than we normally um, run at so typical line items well our, my largest line items would be in that officials and travels category and you, you can see that on the sheet um, those numbers are going to look vastly different than a traditional school in a traditional school year. Um, so interpreting that and, and kind of preparing for the future makes things a little challenging, but um, one area of consistency that has been um, the athletic participation rate and our, our numbers have hovered regularly around 80% and been pleasantly surprised that this is held true for this current year as well. Um, so as a result, we're going to present um, a flat budget overall. Um, no changes 
no increase to the operational side. Um, we've not added any positions. Um, however, there's due to part of the CEEA collective bargaining agreement, stipends have increased. So that's the $1,000 increase that you'll see in the overall athletic budget. Um, so I've kept this fairly short, but it is it's consistent from what was presented last year. And um, I'd be look forward to open, you know, answering any questions in future meetings if anyone has any, but um, that is it. Thank you, Jeff. And finally, Donna from the superintendent's office. Yes, the Office of Superintendent, um, which also includes um, the business office. Um, it, we tried to um, do some cutting as far as looking at lines and um, cutting back on our costs, our expenditures. Um, we did have to add um, under 3,000 uh, professional services um, we do have to do an audit, a single audit for our grants. So we did have to um, uh, increase that, um, that line. Um, really, there's nothing too much um, other than that. Um, but I did propose, it's not really a totally new position, but with, um, with Noel leaving us, it was um, a good opportunity to um, look at um, the technology department and to think about some changes. Um, so I talked to Matt Sturgis um, about the possibility of um, having a director of technology specific to the education side and then having a person specific to the town side. Um, I don't know how Noel has done all he's done, but especially with um, the needs this year for technology and for exploring um, educational uh, programs. Um, and, and as we look towards really trying to increase our and grow our technology department, um, it's really time to think about doing a director of technology piece that is specific to just the school side. Um, because Noel's budget uh, or Noel's salary and benefits are in the school budget and we get reimbursed by the town, um, it's not really an addition to our budget, although it will be um, an increase, a uh, net increase of uh, about $4,369. When you look at um, a reduction in the salary that we're putting in, and um, and a reduction in the reimbursement from the town, um, so we we will be working on a job description for this person. Um, we have this, we've started a collection of job descriptions, and we'll look at what what would really be specific to our district, but um, really help helping out with the technology just specific to education um, and, and really growing our technology program. Um, so that new position request is in there, even though it truly isn't a new request, it's just more of a change that will be again, an increase of just a little over $4,000. Um, Marcy, do you wanna talk about the um, the lunch, uh, the food service piece. Yes, I do. Thanks, Donna. Okay. I'd like to talk about the um, food service, the nutrition budget that is in the general fund, and that's Department 9074. And it's in Peter's section, and it's the top portion of Peter's line item budget. And specifically, I just wanted to talk about the part that we have in the general fund that we use to transfer into nutrition services each year as our subsidy that's provided by property taxes. This year, you will see in that line a jump from what was last year 105,000 to 
is 392,509. So I just wanted to explain this so that you ha start having some ideas of this. So when we talk in the future after our audit meeting and when we go through some discussion of fund balance, um, you, you all can, of course, send me questions about this, definitely, um, between now and then. But the situation is that for the last two years, the nutrition services had a, a deficit. And I, I just want to preface this with saying that we are in great shape compared to our surrounding schools who have experienced extreme deficits in one year from their nutrition services due to the situations that Peter had talked about earlier with running the food services operations during COVID and the cost, high cost of employees. So you will hear this as a common theme among all the other schools and how they're trying to figure out how to handle these high costs. So um, that's what we've had, but our experience is very, um, we're lucky where it's a minimal situation compared to others, but in the, we have a two year deficit that we have from our audited financials. And the combination from two years, the total, is $292,509. That's why the number right now is proposed to be a total of 392,509. This is, and I say proposed because this will be a decision that um, you all can make as we go through this budget process. The proposal that um, that I have uh, in there, and Superintendent Wolfram is, has been thinking about this too, and Peter, we've talked to him as well, is to get rid of this deficit. Um, and you will hear in future conversations that you have an option to use unassigned fund balance at this point. Um, it came in at a situation where you will have that available to you to decide to use. And again, I wanted to prefaces by saying these are all proposed and you can opt to pay the deficit over a course of several years, which is what we had decided to do two years ago with the two year, two year ago deficit. We originally had thought we would continue to pay it over a course of three years, but I was thinking that um, you will want to maybe consider with when you hear information about your unassigned fund balance, the option to pay this deficit so that it wipes it off the books. The auditor also recommends this um, just to clear up the deficit so that we are then starting from zero in the future. And I am not, and so Peter and I every month and Superintendent Wolfram, we monitor the nutrition services um, surplus or deficit each month. And so we will have a good idea of what it will end up by the end of this year as well. And that will give us even more information for future budgets. Right now, I've budgeted 100,000 for the regular subsidy and 292,509 to clear up the deficit. So I know this is like sticker shock right now and I, I want to apologize for the, the sticker shock after all of this wonderful news from the administrators for doing such a great job of keeping everything flat. But that's why it's so great that that has happened because this will give you options. So I wanted to say again, just food for thought. Um, think about this um, coming up in our next set of workshops and when you get more information for what you can decide or think about what you wanna do with the monies available. Um, so it would be a use of unassigned fund balance to wipe out the deficit. That's the proposal at this point. So, all right, I hope, is that enough? Donna, too much? I get yeah, don't get me talking too much. <laughs> and I think you've heard from everybody now. Yes, thank you. I think that is everybody. Thank you, everybody. That was, um, I know a lot of work goes into this and um, this was really helpful to get us started. It was fairly efficient. I think we think, have Zoom to uh, thank a little bit for that. We don't have the being in person, being able to see each other and talk um, a little bit more, but um uh, before I close, I do want, I know we're not going to take questions on the substance here, but if there's any board members or, or, or administrators who have questions about the process, um, I, I would entertain those questions at this point. Um, again, we're going to be meeting again February 23rd. Um, I'd like to get questions in from board members by the 12th of February, Friday. 
and I will collate and get them together, send them to Donna, is that the right way to do it? And you can yeah. distribute um, by February 17th at the latest. If I can work faster, I will, to give you more time um, to get ready. Um, and I anticipate we're gonna have a lot more discussion, more more uh, robust discussion at the next one. This was a good opportunity just to hear and look and listen and go back and digest a little bit. But I think that's, if there are no questions, um, I think we're done. So go enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you guys. Um, and we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Okay, take care. Thank, Thank you, you for all your work. Thank you.